deem this species of property. We have to understand those connections. Those connections are axiomatic. It's obvious. And people were having those fights even in the 19th century and the early 20th century. So the North and South get together on the back of black citizenship and dignity. And remember, Frederick Douglass reminds us, he says, when there was war between the whites, racial slavery ended. In the 19th century, Frederick Douglass asks, what will peace between the whites bring? And the peace is going to be bringing racial terror to black people. And this terror is so profound, Joseph, that by May of 1871, there are public congressional hearings about Klan violence in the United States in May of 1871. January 19th of 1871 is when Congress launches the investigation into Klan violence. This is almost 150 years to the day of the January 6th insurrection and assault. So we've been here before, right? And we all now know about Tulsa in 1921, but before Tulsa and over 300 black people being massacred in the Greenwood, Black Wall Street section of Tulsa and having an incendiary device dropped and having dozens of buildings burned to the ground, there was Memphis in 1866 and New Orleans. There was Hamburg, South Carolina. There was the Mississippi Shotgun Plan of 1875. This is all well documented, right? We were having public congressional hearings about this. Thaddeus Stevens, the radical reconstructionist, abolitionist, Pennsylvania representative and chairman of the House Ways and Means Committee is saying that black people by the thousands are being buried in unmarked graves in the 1860s. He's saying this, right? So this is our history. And what's so extraordinary for me is that the, the beauty of American history is when, out of all that pain, when you confront that pain, you can actually imagine right, a country, like Dr. King said, be true to what you put on paper in his last speech. Right? You can actually imagine the beloved community because you can think about black and white suffragists. You can think about Latinx folks who were humiliated and tortured in the Brazeros program. You can think about indigeneity and what happened to native southerners, who are not white, by the way, native southerners, like Taya Miles calls them, in the 18th and 19th centuries, who were dispossessed. You can think about queer folks and what's happened to the dehumanization of queer folks, not just from white and mainstream communities, but in all our communities. Because we've marginalized them. We've marginalized them, right? So we can think about all these different groups of people. We can think about what's happening with Asian hate crimes in the United States right now. And when the President of the United States calls COVID-19 a Chinese virus, and that starts an uptick of massive bullying and physical assaults against Asian descended folks, right? We have to understand that the only way to stop all of that is by talking about why was that necessary in the first place, right? And for all of us who are here, we can't think of Tulsa or Japanese internment camps or anti-Semitism against Jews as something that they did to them. We have to get to the maturity and the vulnerability to think about that as something that's happened to all of us, right? And so we can't value blonde, blue-eyed kids in Ukraine or the United States more than black and brown kids who are suffering globally as well. We can't. You can't have a civil society if that's the case. If you're saying aspirationally, you want to build a beloved community, you want to achieve the, a different country, right? an undiscovered country, you can't play favorites like that. And you can't have institutions and structures which are just us. We're the government. We're the institutions and structures, and it's animated by the story we tell to ourselves about ourselves. So when you, when you say the story that I'm saying is critical race theory to end debate, to say this is unpatriotic, this is another red scare, this is communism, there's no hope when you do that. There's no hope, right? So what, what I try to do here 
And then I, very briefly, the third reconstruction, 2008 to 2000, really continuing, but I document till 2021 and 22 with Justice Jackson, Katanji. And this is a period where there's four pivot points. It's the election of Barack Obama. It's the rise of BLM 1.0 after Trayvon Martin's death. It's the rise of MAGA and Donald Trump in 2016. And then it's all the juxtapositions we see throughout 2020. The pandemic, the BLM protests, the most racially divisive presidential election in American history. But then the biggest democratic upsurge in American history with the most people going to the polls in American history. The January 6th assault overshadows the elections of Warnock and Ossoff, the first Jewish and first black senators in Georgian history, the history of the Peach State, overshadows the, the deep and heroic work of Stacey Abrams at the grassroots to make sure everyone has equal access to the ballot after losing an election in 2018 that it was as fraudulent as elections during Reconstruction where we had redemptionist governments take over during Reconstruction between the 1870s and the 1890s. That's why at one point I quote the black congressman Thomas Miller who says we were eight years in power, right? During the 1895 South Carolina Convention, and that's a convention that is called to expressly disenfranchise black voters. And what Thomas Miller says, he says, we were eight years in power. We reconstructed South Carolina's economy. We created the first public schools. We created health care and anti-poverty efforts. And we are being marginalized out of the reforms that we did because of white supremacy. Right? And this is 1895. So this is an American tragedy that, that worsens the more we fail to confront it. Right? And the positives of 2020 was the confrontation. And I'm not talking about violence. I mean the confrontation with ourselves, with our history, because this is really a history of us. And so when we talk about racial justice, when we talk about eliminating anti-blackness, this is what Dr. Martin Luther King was talking about when he said, we could build a beloved community, but what King said was that he was a molder of consensus. He wasn't going to tell the nation what it wanted to hear. He was courageous enough to tell the nation what it needed to hear, right? And so when we think about how do we right now build a beloved community and move forward, one of the things I talk about is the optimism of seeing people like Stacey Abrams, but also seeing grassroots activists like Tamika Mallory and Alicia Garza seeing so many different groups getting together to try to fight mass incarceration, to try to fight inequality in public schools, to, to try to fight segregation in public schools and neighborhoods, to try to fight, we see what's happening in Jackson, Mississippi with infrastructure right now, um, and unclean water, not just Flint, but Jackson and all these places. Environmental racism, the number one people who are marginalized are black and brown communities when we think about environmental racism. The number one kids who are suffering from asthma in the United States are black communities. The number one group that needs health care and needs mental wellness are black communities. Most of them led by black women, millions of them living below the poverty line that Daniel Patrick Moynihan um, demonized in 1965 and people said yes. Black women are not human, right? That's our country. That's the country. But to, to, to tell a different story, that's what Nicole was so brilliant in the 1619 Project. We don't have to agree with everything on the page, 1619 Project. We can be critical thinkers, but the idea that we need a new origin story. And that origin story is not just black. We have to talk about indigenous people. We've got to talk about AAPI. We've got to talk about our gender queer folks. We've got to talk about Muslims and Jews. We've got to talk about all these groups of people, but the reason why I always argue that blackness serves as a common denominator for universality, because black people are, like Derek Bell taught us years ago, the faces at the bottom of the well, right? It's not, it's not a fight we want to win in that caste system, being at the, the bottom of the rung, right? And people talk about oppression Olympics, but black people are the ones who created global capitalism because our labor and our very bodies were exploited. 
We were financialized like mortgage securities. And there are so many, and Joseph knows there's so many different scholars writing great books about slavery and the Lehman Brothers, slavery and banking, slavery and Wall Street, um, Ebony and Ivy by Craig Wilder. Harvard University has just released its report on racial slavery and is condemning itself and gonna pay a billion dollars in reparations and do some stuff with HBCUs. But all that is not enough if we're unwilling to craft a new story that goes beyond American exceptionalism, right? That goes, American exceptionalism is that story that talks about America like a bedtime story, a beginning, a middle, and an end. American exceptionalism is that idea that we are constantly perfecting our union and bad things might have happened, but we're constantly getting better and better, except it's based on two big lies. The first lie is that black people were not human beings, and you needed that dehumanization lie to get through racial slavery and to create a supply chain that everyone was implicated in during racial slavery. Not just people who owned, because even Native Americans owned black people. Okay, even Native Americans, some groups, not all. So just because one in five white people own black people, people say, well, I had nothing to do with this. What are you talking about? You had everything to do with it. What, what racial slavery sets up is a supply chain and a caste system that benefits white people over black people in perpetuity, okay? That's what it sets up. When you think about racial slavery, Racial slavery does not end in 1865, and everyone is implicated because it sets up the built landscape and environment of the United States of America. It sets up our financial, our industrial, our educational, our political, our economic, our cultural foundations as a nation in perpetuity. And people were so fearful and had so much anxiety after 1865 that what happens if we no longer have racist capitalism? Not racial capitalism, I call it racist capitalism. What happens if our wealth is not predicated on the dehumanization and exploitation and subordination of black people? No one wanted to find out, and they still haven't found out. They still haven't found out. So when we think about the period that we're in now, right, and people talk about privilege, and people talk about power, and this racial caste system, the only way to explode that caste system is by being honest with ourselves. We have to be willing to tell a story about America that confronts what's still happening. These aren't just legacies of slavery and white supremacy. They're continuing right in front of our eyes, right? Linda Villarosa has the new book on healthcare and racism in the health in the healthcare industry and how it disproportionately impacts black women. She had done the 10,000 word New York Times article in 2018, the cover of Serena Williams documenting what happened to Serena, how Serena almost died having Olympia, right? These aren't all just vestiges of slavery and saying, well, black people just don't, they're eating too much soul food. They have a bad diet. It's your own fault. And that's the narrative. This is institutionalized and structural, but the institutions and structures are us. All right, I've been gone, going too long. <laughs>